I'm Kelly Martinez and I'm from Iowa originally, but I've lived in South Dakota for more of my life than Iowa, so I say South Dakota. I'm a three-time surrogate and a mother of three of my own children. With my childhood, it was, we moved a lot. My dad had a lot of mental health problems, so very abusive childhood. When I was 13, my brother shot and killed my dad to kind of put an end to the abuse. My mom found out she had cancer when I was 16. Just when I felt like things were gonna be normal family-wise, and my mom got remarried to an amazing guy. Her happily ever after was just about to start, and then when they got back from their honeymoon, she found out she had cancer, and she died within the year. I got married at 17 and had my son when I was 17. We had Madison when I was 19. Things were just starting to get a little normal and then my brother took his own life. Finances were tough at the time. Um, you know, we're a young married couple, two small kids in the home now. And then that's when I seen the first advertisement in a local newspaper for surrogate mothers wanted. My initial feelings about surrogacy, I guess, weren't good. You know, I just thought that it was just wrong, you know, for somebody to do that for other people. I mean, it's a blessing, I guess, but at the same time, you know, I just didn't feel it was right to do that, but. It was something that it was very important to Kelly and the money played a big factor in it, you know, we really needed that money. I was just working a waitressing job. Jay was in between jobs off and on. And so when I seen that surrogacy ad and how much money you can make in there, I felt like it was gonna fix everything. When you look at the advertisement, whether they're advertising to, to women to sell their eggs or whether they're advertising to women to consider being a surrogate, they don't advertise the rest. If you go and buy a pack of cigarettes, the first thing you see is a warning label on the side of a package of cigarettes that this may be hazardous to your health. The risk that these women incur is downplayed if they're even told at all. People die every day in the United States waiting for an organ. And we don't say, oh my gosh, we have a crisis. We need to start paying and buying and selling organs. We're really mindful of how money corrupts and how people who need money will be the ones who will take the risk. When you find out how much you can make from being a surrogate and how it's delivered to you as like this glamorous thing, you know, you're gonna be catered to and you're just gonna have everything handled. When my brother passed away, he didn't have life insurance. We struggled to pay for the tombstone for him, you know, and I just, I wanted to kind of make, hopefully make like a financial cushion in my life. And it, it was a lot of money so I could do the surrogacy. I had really easy pregnancies and I could still work my regular job as a waitress. Pregnancies and generally for Kelly go excellent. She doesn't have any complications, you know, with our kids. She'd work right up until the due date and she had no problem. She'd have them and then, you know, with a few days later, she'd go back to work full time. I mean, it's crazy. She's very strong. In my mind, I'd be making money 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That was my selling point to him as well, is we're going to make $25,000 in nine months. We thought everything would be nice and smooth, you know. I mean, we weren't real sure about planting the embryos and stuff like that, but you know, when we found out information and stuff, it didn't sound like it was anything too complicated. That money would have been super beneficial and that was just what I needed to do, what I needed to make happen to take care of my family. Well, if there wasn't money involved in the surrogacy, I don't think we probably ever would have done this. I mean, even with the easy pregnancies and stuff, the money was the main reason that we did it. We went ahead and went forward and decided to try to get matched with a couple. On the application though, we said that we wouldn't work with a gay couple. The reasoning behind that is we were small town Iowa. That would be really hard to explain, but they looked past that part and went ahead and found me a match like really fast, but with a gay couple from Paris. One of the reasons why I got really involved in the area of assisted reproductive technologies was the fact that my original training is in nursing. Two, I'm a woman and I was raising daughters. And three, I was concerned about the ethics of using otherwise healthy young women who aren't patients to sell parts of their bodies and the, the health risks of these women. So in that work that I do, I sort of expanded it to not only look at egg donation, but sperm donation, surrogate womb, and the whole area of assisted reproductive technology, designer babies, you know, creating the perfect child, 
uh, and all the ethics, if you will, around, um, around these technologies. When you talk about starting the surrogacy, they talk about how, f how soon you get money. You get money for doing the injections. If you fly here, you know, like the money can start fast if you match fast. And so that was intriguing to me because we were still financially struggling. So even though they called with a gay couple as our match, I got excited. I was ready to do it. Um, so I had to convince Jay the same way the lady on the phone convinced me. They're an amazing married couple. Um, people don't really want to help them because the fact that they're gay, um, I feel like it was a little bit of a guilt trip on the agency's part. They told us about this couple, the agency called us and then gave us some information, kind of made us feel bad for them, you know, that they had been trying so long to do this. They were a married couple and they had been trying to have kids and stuff. So we discussed it back and forth and decided that we needed the money at the time. So we decided to go ahead with it. I have read countless surrogate contracts that, that surrogate mothers sign, and overwhelmingly, everything is tied to money. The surrogate must do X, Y, and Z, and if she doesn't do X, Y, and Z, she will have to pay the money back. The payments will stop. She will be threatened with lawsuit for breach of contract, which costs money, because you have to hire a lawyer then to fight this breach of contract. And, you know, this happened in Kelly's case as well. You know, she was told, this is your contract and, you know, you have to follow these particular orders. The whole entire vision I had of how it was going to go is not how it turned out at all with that first surrogacy. Each time they needed something, they had me in a, a situation where they had the upper hand. When you do a surrogacy contract, the contract, they can tell you what you're going to do for the next however many weeks they are renting your body. The first surrogacy we did from Kelly's experience was not good. I mean, we signed up, we started doing doctor's appointments and stuff, and then, yeah, they started just telling us things that we had to do for them, and if we didn't, then we had to start paying back money to them, and it was all had to be paid back right away. So we were just kind of bullied that whole time in the first one, first surrogacy. She was even told, you'll have to keep the children. Well, of course, most surrogates don't go into the arrangement to keep the children. You know, they go into the arrangement because they need money and they're trying to help somebody have children. So it's, it's um, unconscionable to me how much they are controlled and this threat, this looming threat of if you don't comply, it's gonna cost you. They were gonna put two embryos in. They get more for their money if they put two in is how it was explained. So the night before we were supposed to go for the transfer, uh, the agency had called and said that something had came up and that we were going to need to put my name on the birth certificate it, just for a little bit. And it was it was a real simple process to get my name off. But if, if I couldn't do that or I wouldn't agree to that, then we weren't able to continue with the process and everything that had been paid for at my expense up to that point, I would need to reimburse the couple for. I did not go into this to go further in debt. Some of the things that we were asked to do were uh, lie, falsify information, um, you know, Kelly had to be on the birth certificate. Um, you know, it was just a bunch of things that they had told us in the beginning were not gonna happen. They had an egg donor. Um, they were both gonna be donors. We didn't wanna back out. Uh, we, we couldn't financially back out at that point. So we went ahead with the transfer and they put in two embryos and we became pregnant with twins on the first trap. With it being twins, I did have to quit my waitressing job just because it was a lot harder on me than a single teen pregnancy, which that's all I had done before with both my children. Part of the problem, as we see in Kelly's case, is just the international complexities. So when surrogacy isn't allowed in one country and couples come to another country in order to have their children through surrogacy, problems can arise getting the children back into the country where the parents want them to be. So Kelly's first surrogacy was for a gay couple in France. All of surrogacy is illegal in France. And what happened once the children were actually born was the couple um, had trouble getting passports to get the children back to France. Delivery was a little scary. We did deliver one vaginally and one by C-section. The second baby had turned and it wouldn't, they couldn't get it to turn back around to get it to come out, so they had to rush her in and they had to cut her open and take the other one out through a C-section. 
The recovery time was a little more difficult than as planned, and we had Brody and Madison at home, both under the age of two. Uh, the agency called and we needed to help the couple expedite the birth certificates. We had to load her up in a car when she was very sore and hurting and then go three and a half hours to Des Moines to get the birth certificates. And then we got home after that. And not very long after that, they contacted us again and said that we needed to go to Chicago, which is six hours away, while she's still trying to heal for this. Then we were told if we, if we couldn't do all that, um, then they couldn't take the twins home, which hindered the issue with my name being on the birth certificate um, because in the state of Iowa, those were my kids. I couldn't take care of twins and take care of my two kids and my wife all at the same time. And so we pretty much just had to go through with it. We thought that Chicago, that was, it was gonna be simple. We were almost done. And that's when they told us the story about how I cheated on Jay, that I had met one of the gentlemen at a bar in Iowa and became pregnant with twins. And in order to save my marriage, I needed to let him take our children to Paris because Jay wouldn't let me keep them. That was the first time we had heard that story. Um, I was so numb feeling, I didn't know what to do. And then they did that, if you don't, we can't take them to Paris, um, you know, and Jay was, Jay was instantly mad. When we went to meet them, they wouldn't let Jay go with me um, or the other gentleman. It was just the guy that I had relationships with, according to them. And then they handed me a car seat and a diaper bag um, that I know nothing about. It was ridiculous, the amount of stuff that we were forced to do and lied, you know, they lied about that we just had to go along with, you know, because, I mean, they had us, you know, they gave us money and then after we had used some of it, then they pretty much knew we couldn't back out of it and they used it against us, so. We were in it for the long haul. She was afraid, you know, basically told, if you don't do this, you will have to keep these children. She didn't have the money to raise these children. She didn't want to have two more children. She was a busy mom with her own children. And so she agreed um, to go to the consulate. She doesn't really know what happened in the meeting because it was all done in French. When we got off the elevator, as soon as I stepped off, it was like I stepped into a different country. I don't speak French, I don't read French, everything was in French, nobody spoke English, nobody translated anything for me. Uh, the gentleman and the lady behind the desk had a conversation, um, I have no idea what was said. And then when the paperwork started coming, they just pointed where to sign, I don't know what it said. The gentleman that I was with and the lady, they, they exchanged laughs, I, I looked I'm sure panicked because I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was being said and I'm holding, holding the little girl that I don't know much about. And then when we walked back down, it, it was over. They said it was over. It was supposed to be over at that point. The drive going back home from Chicago was just very sad and lonely. I mean, we didn't talk much. We were both just very upset. You know, she's still hurting, um, taking meds, you know, from her C-section and stuff and just delivering twins and then having to get hauled all over the place to, you know, handle their stuff that we shouldn't have ever had to do. I was sick to my stomach with the story that they had come up with. Um, first of all, I didn't cheat on my husband and those were not my kids, those were not my babies. For them to, I don't know, I guess it's hard to believe that if they were my children, I'd just be like, here, you take them. That's not something a mother would do. We stayed in contact and then eight years later, they had one more thing for me to do because in Paris, that's when gay marriage was recognized. I was under the impression from the very beginning that they were married, only to find out years later that they weren't. And once they became legally married, they wanted to do an adoption proceeding so the other gentleman could officially adopt and put his name on the birth certificate where my name is still at. Um, I was advised legally not to do that. There was so much deception through that whole surrogacy uh, as far as the couple, the agency, and so to protect myself, I, I didn't do it. The negatives are what stands out the most in that first surrogacy that I did. Um, the lies, the deceit, what it put on my family, what they put Jay through. I honestly never thought I would do it again. A few years after the first surrogacy is when um, 
we were introduced to the idea of doing it again. I started seeing a counselor. I've seen counselor for numerous times throughout my life, like after my dad died, after my mom died, after my brother died. And then during the surrogacy, um, I was attending counseling with a lady. And then she had mentioned to me about a couple that she was counseling that had fertility issues. They were a local couple and that they couldn't have a child of their own. They were a great couple, very nice. After meeting with them for a while, we decided to go ahead and do it again with, for them. When you think about when you go see your doctor, or you go meet with your attorney, or you go meet with your professional counselor, you should rightly think that they're not gonna put you in harm's way. And so when I think of Kelly seeking the professional help of a counselor, and the counselor saying, oh, maybe you should go do this, when part of the reason Kelly's coming to see you is for help dealing with being abused as a surrogate and, and all of her other family problems. Again, I was intrigued by the money, and I thought it would be different um, because it was a husband and a wife, um, so there would be a female involved with me. And in my mind, I had this thing that we would like go to appointments together and experience and enjoy the whole pregnancy together. We thought this was gonna be, you know, this one would be really good because we, we knew the people, they were in Iowa where we lived and so we could stay close to them and they were really involved with everything. So, you know, but financially we needed help again, you know, to try to get a little savings account built back up or something. I was hoping it was going to go better, smoother, um, because an agency wasn't involved and with them being a local couple, that things would be easier. With the second surrogacy, we didn't make as much because we didn't have two babies. They only wanted one embryo put in, they only wanted one child. Um, so first attempt, they put in one embryo, we had a singleton. So it was about 18000 for what they call your base fee. So Kelly agreed to help the couple. Uh, that was recommended to Kelly by her counselor. And so Kelly got pregnant uh, with this couple's baby. It was very frustrating for Kelly because the intended mother used her own eggs and was severely sick and was hospitalized. So Kelly was not really comfortable moving forward with the surrogate pregnancy because they were really worried that this, this woman would die. So the intended mother for the second couple um, wanted to use her own eggs and ended up going to Mayo. She had complications um, and almost lost her life just giving the eggs up and so we were a little bit concerned about that. She had um, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and she got very sick, like she put on a lot of, of weight, um, had issues with the lungs, fluid around the lungs. And so there was one point in that where I had to ask her if she wanted us to go to the embryo transfer appointment because it was kind of that, you didn't know if she was going to make it because it was pretty serious condition that she was in. Um, so she wasn't able to attend the embryo transfer appointment because she was in the hospital in a different state at that time. We went ahead and did the transfer, um, got pregnant the first try. Everything went fairly well during that pregnancy. Um, they weren't as involved as I thought they were gonna be, uh, so it was kind of just me going to the appointments, doing it by myself. Um, delivery went good. I no serious issues with the delivery. But um, afterwards, the couple ended up in a pretty rough divorce um, custody situation. I feel guilty there um, had I not cared for them or you know brought their child into this world she wouldn't be put in that situation I stay in touch with the father and so with the little girl but the mother is no longer in the picture involved with the little girl at all it's heartbreaking for me to know that she the little girl that I carried for them has gone through some heartbreak and and I know it, it had to be hard for her with her parents splitting up. It was hard with the second surrogacy to um, go ahead with the embryo transfer the night before, considering the fact that the mother was in a life or death situation from wanting the child to be biologically hers with using her own eggs. The fertility clinic didn't, didn't take that into consideration. They still went ahead with the embryo transfer, even knowing the mother's condition at the time. I became pregnant with our third child, and I wasn't happy in Iowa, so we decided to move back to South Dakota. So again, the financial stresses came to surface. 
So I was thinking about it and you know, my pregnancy had been easy with Marley and so I got in contact with the agency that I had talked to in the past um, just to see, I, I wasn't sure how Jay was gonna respond to me suggesting to do another surrogacy. I was pretty hesitant about it. You know, I didn't really want to do it, but we discussed everything like we always do. And, you know, we knew financially if we wanted to get get started, you know, we needed to do something that was going to give us a good jump start, and that would, you know. So we decided to go with it. I didn't realize how risky it was for myself to do another surrogacy. Nobody tells you that. They don't give you the details. So I didn't, I didn't see those risks. I had just seen the financial part again and was gonna help my family out um, one more time. Everybody knows what big pharma is. Everybody knows what big tobacco is. Big pharma, big t fertility, big tobacco is when a corporation, an industry, doesn't concern themselves with harming their customers. I'm a nurse, I'm not against pharmaceutical companies. When I'm sick, I take medication. But big pharma is a distortion of good pharma. Um, it's, it's like we will risk people's health and do unethical things because we wanna make money. The same thing with big fertility. Their bottom line is making money. They're not leading the cause saying, we don't want anybody to be harmed. We don't want women to be harmed if they sell their eggs. We, we, wanna, we wanna do the studies so that we can give good informed consent. And so I think big fertility is a distortion of what for ethical fertility medicine should be doing and practicing. The last surrogacy that I did, the motivation was I didn't have a steady job at the time. I was kind of in between jobs. We're trying to raise three kids. Jay does construction, so his work is really weather permitting. The money's always there with surrogacy. You know that you're gonna get that money, you know, once everything takes off, if it works, you get your monthly checks, and it, it's a nice cushion, um, takes off the financial stress that we were having. I sent in my profile. It's kind of like matchmaker. They recommend what couple they think fits what I'm looking for and what the couple's looking for. And so they found the couple from Spain that loved my profile, they loved everything about me, my history, my experience. At first everything seemed to go very well, you know, the embryos were implanted and everything was fine and then Kelly went to find out what they were having. So Kelly asked them if they wanted to know and they said yeah, they already knew. We're having a boy and a girl, no one told you? So I was a little confused because I didn't know they did that. They had paid extra money and had a test done and specifically put in a boy embryo and a girl embryo and I was not advised of that. It's pretty common for surrogates to be asked to carry twins or triplets. It puts the, the surrogate mother at a higher risk because she's carrying multiples, but it's a cost savings. Couples can pay up to close to 150,000. Um, I know the first couple that we worked with from Paris, they, they were up in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. I didn't realize how frustrated I would be with the breakdown of who makes what until this last surrogacy when I received an email of a statement that I wasn't supposed to see and I seen how much the fertility doctors make, how much attorneys make, how much people make that don't go through anything near what I go through and how much more they're paid. There was one um, doctor in there that I think I seen maybe one time uh, that made close to 18,000. He made close to what I made for everything that I had went through. We did the ultrasound to determine the sex of the babies and that is when we found out that they were having two boys. Dr. Deal had informed us that there was a one in a million chance that the embryo the girl embryo got kicked out and the boy embryo split into identical twins. But it happened. And this couple was not, just did not understand that. They just couldn't comprehend the fact that they were gonna have twin boys and not a boy and a girl. Instantly the reaction from the mother, she, you could tell that she was upset. Her messages back to me were all capital letters, exclamation point, she didn't understand. She felt the ultrasound was wrong. They immediately requested an additional ultrasound. From that point on, the surrogacy just, 
it just went downhill. My wife, the stress just shot through the roof with her. Um, and the text messages and stuff that she was receiving was ridiculous, you know, about why they were not having a girl too, because they paid for it. And, you know, we told them that's something you have to talk to the agency about, you know, we're doing what you hired us to do. So we went for the additional ultrasound to find out that it was still two boys. So we informed the couple again that they were having two boys. And then that's when things kind of just spiraled out of control. She stopped messaging me. Uh, she wasn't concerned about me anymore. Uh, the focus was how I was having two boys. And the couple wasn't happy, you know, the, with the fact they were having two boys because they did pay an extra $5,000 to get the girl embryo implanted and it just didn't take. She actually just kind of stopped communicating with me unless it was a question regarding it was two boys. Through some of the text messages and emails we got, the, the mother did kind of hint around that it might have been something that Kelly did, but the doctors quickly explained to her that there's nothing that she could have done, but she just was never happy with that ever. Then things kind of got scary because it was brought up a couple times, like maybe we should have a plan B um, for the boys. As in, like, I felt like the agency felt like they weren't going to come to the States to get their children. It is hard, too, because you, you can't write a law that covers everything. Cause I would never think somebody who's paid $150,000, $200,000 for a baby didn't want it. You know, it's just how <laughs> we, you don't think that's a possibility, but apparently it is. I continued my job and to carry my health insurance to cover the pregnancy. And then after Christmas, I gained close to like 30 pounds in one week. And I, I was really struggling. I couldn't breathe. My, I was having numbness in my face. Um, it, it scared me. It really scared me. It's pretty hard because I've got a mom and I've got a baby or two babies, and they're in front of me. And they are my patients. Um, I've had where a surrogate mom refused a vaccination and the mom knew it was a good idea, you know, and, and so that was complicated. It's like, who has ultimate say here, you know, and, um, and you really straddle that line and you don't know. I mean, there were all sorts of times I didn't know who I was supposed to listen to. And it something always comes up where you, you don't know who to go with. My wife got preeclampsia, which is very high blood pressure. It can cause severe problems in a woman. It could actually take her life, and the doctor was very concerned about this. So at that point in time, he admitted her to the hospital and kept her there because her blood pressure would spike so high. The surrogate mother is, think of her as an organ donor. She's pregnant with a foreign embryo. Our female bodies were never designed to carry other people's babies. So in surrogacy, you'll see a surrogate mother is gonna be at higher risk of preeclampsia, maternal hypertension, gestational diabetes. All of this puts her into a high-risk pregnancy category. And of course, when a mother is in a high-risk pregnancy category, the babies are also at risk because the mother's sick. I was under so much stress, the fact that I was carrying two boys and that's not what the intended parents wanted. So just with that and everything else all factored in that I just went to the extreme for my preeclampsia stage that I, I got to in within a week. During that time I didn't work, I took that week off because I'm self-employed so I can, but yeah, I was very nervous. I had to be there as much as possible, you know, if something were to happen and I wasn't there, I mean, it would just, that would kill me. My kids were very involved too because they're older and they got scared. Um, my middle daughter, she was devastated because you can Google preeclampsia and see what the worst case scenario is and it's it's death. The doctor said, you know, you you could make it to 40 weeks, you could go tomorrow, like it was very, Nobody knew what was going to happen, so I just continued my meds, monitoring, and then Friday morning, the couple just walked into my room, and that was the first time that I had ever met them in person. Nobody knew they were coming, not even the agency, they just walked in. So I was laying there hooked up to these machines. Um, 
I was miserable, I, it, I was in pain, everything was just kind of a mess. And the first thing out of their mouth when they walked into the room, and Dr. Deal luckily happened to be in there at the time doing a check, is they wanted to know if it was two boys. It shocked me, it took me by surprise. I was really frustrated and like, are you kidding me? So Dr. Deal said right then and there, he said, we'll do an ultrasound and we'll do it right now. We ordered, we paid for, this is what we wanted. And immediately the relationship between the couple in Spain and Kelly and all the doctors and nurses and the agency on the US side was broken. The Spanish couple wanted to know who screwed up, who made the mistake, whose fault was this, why aren't they getting what they, they deserved. And of course that caused all kinds of anxiety because Kelly started to worry, well, they won't, they won't want these children. Even Kelly's doctor, Dr. Deal, said we need to have a game plan. What if they don't come from Spain? Delivery was, it, it was very scary because I didn't have any family there with me because it happened so fast. Unfortunately, the only person that made it to the delivery room was the intended mother. She just kind of stood to the back of me and didn't say much, never cried, never teared, never showed emotion on her face. As a husband and father, I was super stressed out as this was going on because, you know, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, my wife might die delivering these babies and now I've got to raise these three kids, you know, and I mean, it's just, I was stressed out to the max. I was very nervous that I would, might lose my wife. I don't pray a lot, but I prayed that time because I was totally out of control. I had no control of what was happening. I couldn't see, Jay wasn't there. I didn't know what was gonna happen. Um, I never once ever intended to go into something like this to leave my kids. And that's that was the reality of what could have happened. The boys ended up being born 10 weeks premature to the day. And just before how that happened, like it happened so quickly there was like maybe a 40 minute window from the time my condition worsened to the time we had to deliver uh, dr deal came in the room once my blood pressure readings were through the chart i couldn't see he came in and that's when he said that we had to deliver then uh, or someone wasn't coming out of the delivery room alive so the boys were at risk being 10 weeks premature and i was at risk because i was borderline stroke my liver was shutting down, my kidneys were shutting down. Dr. Deal was with me, he did amazing. He coached me, he kept me calm. And then they they can test the placenta and that's the only time she spoke up in the delivery room is when they said, you know, are we having the placenta tested? She said yes and Dr. Deal said yes. Um, the only reason they did that is to prove that, that those were their two boys. Right still to the, in, in the middle of delivery, she was still concerned that how she got two boys. So the placenta had to be tested. They were very hung up on the fact that they did not get what they paid for. They didn't care that they were having two beautiful baby boys. That didn't even register to them. All they knew is they weren't getting the girl they wanted. I was still awake um, for the C-section, but uh, when the boys came out, they cried, but they sounded like little kittens, but they had enough to make these squeaking sounds. So at that point, I started crying because nobody knew what the outcome was gonna be. Um, I cried, she did not cry, she just stood there. They rushed the boys out of the room immediately to get them to the NICU. By the time I got back to my room, I had no idea what was happening in the NICU. Um, I was still in pretty rough shape. Um, I ended up vomiting a lot afterwards. Blood pressure was still really high. So the next morning, I didn't know much. The nurses kind of told me the boys are doing good. They were breathing on their own. They didn't need the machines. And then it was later that following day when the nurses came to me and asked me if I knew when the intended parents were gonna be back. So I asked the nurse what she had meant, and she, the boys were born at 9 p.m. that night before, and the nurse informed me that the intended parents left by 10 that night. So they spent a total of an hour with the boys, um, and then they left them alone in the NICU until late afternoon the following day. So the first hours that those boys really needed somebody to be by them, um, they were alone in the NICU. I wasn't able to go see the boys right away. Um, I couldn't walk. Um, I was really still, I wasn't out of the woods yet. And so I didn't get to go see the boys until the day that I was getting ready to leave. And when Jay and I went in there, the chair was still empty um, next to them. The couple wasn't there. 
So we went in and as soon as we went in, Jay started talking to the boys and the nurses said that that was the first time that they had seen that much movement out of them because they recognized his voice. When the parents were there with them for the brief moments they were, they didn't recognize their voice, they didn't know who they were, so they didn't respond to them like they did to Jay and I. When I left, I stopped and, you know, seen the boys, and then I told them I'm going home, and then the next day I asked her if she could send me some pictures, keep me updated, let me know how they're doing. She never, never let me know how they were doing. I had to go there to see myself. Well, then that's when the bills started coming in and questions started coming up, and then the couple was demanding my medical records. It's pretty common in the structure of setting up a surrogacy contract to set up an, an escrow account. Surrogates are usually paid a little bit of money at the beginning. Sometimes they get a monthly payment throughout the course of the pregnancy, reimbursement for maternity clothes, gas to doctor's appointments, and then of course the lump sum payment at the end when the babies are delivered. They refused to pay a bill that came in until I released my medical records. So I had to drive up to Rapid and sign papers and they were really hard on Dr. Deal. They wanted conferences and they, they wanted answers. They ended up freezing the escrow account and refused to pay any of the bills. Um, and that's when I knew things were really, really gone wrong at that point. And the bills just kept coming in because with a delivery like that, my hospital stay, all the extra tests, I mean, they piled up really fast. It was over $10,000 in doctor bills that they still wouldn't pay and they were starting to go to collections, but it was reflecting on my wife's credit. I didn't save $10,000 to pay these bills. They're like, I'm sorry, these bills are still in your name. Somebody needs to pay them. You need to pay them. It actually did reflect on our credit because it hurt Kelly's credit because all them bills went to collections for over a year and they were all in Kelly's name. And so, yeah, it just totally ruined her credit. So on top of the fact we did all this to help us financially, it ended up hurting us even worse than before we even started it. There was talk about wage garnishments and things like that. Um, I kept contacting the agency. I, I kind of just kept getting the runaround for a year until they found out that I found somebody to help me have a voice in what I had went through. I went to contact the senator of South Dakota to get their visas blocked so that they couldn't travel back to Spain. And then we found out that the couple had already left the United States a month earlier than they were supposed to leave. I'm assuming the couple went back to Spain. Um, they kind of just disappeared and no, their attorney wouldn't return calls. Um, the agency didn't know. All these bills were there sitting there and nobody knows what happened to the boys. I never heard from the couple again. When I tell people about uh, Kelly, you know, they're just so shocked. But the sad thing, and what I tell people too, is that I know 50 Kellys. You know, yes, her story's horrible, but she's not the only one. Brittany, Heather, Kelly, Tanya, Elisa, another Heather, Gail. I mean, how many? How many Kellys do we have to have before laws change? After the twins were born, I went through some really hard times. I ended up quitting my full-time job, kind of just lost control of myself, really didn't know my purpose. I started drinking more. Um, I seen my doctor, she put me on some medication, gave me some anxiety meds. Um, I was having lots of panic attacks. Uh, I didn't have closure with the boys. I still don't have closure. I got attached and, and it's ruined me for getting attached to them. I don't know how to fix that. So I just want to be able to share my story. If I can educate at least one person to not go through or risk what I did, then it would help me. Kelly, like many surrogates I know, has, has now been diagnosed with PTSD. I've seen it again and again, you know, when women are, suffer the trauma, whether it be physical, uh, psychological, emotional trauma that these women go through in surrogacy. There's some days that are harder than others, um, especially around the time when the boys are born and not knowing what happened to them. It affects not only me, but it, it affects my family. It's changed me as a person um, in more ways than one. Part of the thing that Kelly's doing to sort of um, make sense out of this, if you will, is you know she's joined the movement to the global movement to stop surrogacy. Kelly struggled for a long time, you know, because she just felt like she had no voice. She got bullied and all this stuff. She couldn't do anything. And the agency 
didn't pay on that third surrogacy. They wouldn't pay any of the bills or anything until Kelly contacted them and let them know that we were going to Spain with Jennifer Lowell to stand up to fight against this stuff. The very next day, the agency paid the bills that were due. Since I found somebody to help me find my voice in what happened to me, I have been able to speak. I went to Spain, I've spoken New York, I spoke at the UN. Just to share my story to kind of give light of the, the negative part of surrogacy that's not on the news and not with the Hollywood movie stars that are having their babies through surrogacy. And it gave me a chance to educate on what can go wrong, show that even the contracts don't protect anybody. I'm speaking out today so that I might save others from the disappointments and hurts that I have had. To let you know that there is no protection for surrogates against exploitation and vulnerability. I think surrogacy is a human rights violation. It's a human rights violation to the woman and to the children. So in that vein, I would never say, oh, well, let's just regulate slavery. I think it's, it's a violation of the human rights and the dignity of a person to be enslaved. You read a surrogate contract, basically they're a slave for nine months. Everything they eat, sleep, where they can travel, who they can have sex with, I mean, it's all controlled in a contract. So how can you regulate that to make it acceptable? That's absurd to say that you can regulate something that is a human rights violation and robs people of their inherent dignity. You can't regulate that. Oh, Jennifer has had a huge impact on Kelly. Ever since Kelly has been in contact with her through that first email, her whole attitude has changed. I'm getting my wife back, it's her again. When we spoke to the members of the Spanish Parliament, we spoke to a group of women. They were a little more understanding where I was coming from when I was trying to educate on, you know, I almost died, this is the risk, you know, it's not worth the risk. But then when we spoke to a different panel and there, there was gentlemen in there, the one gentleman made a comment to me, you know, well, you've done it three times. Um, that really frustrated me. I, I, get, I understand that I've done it three times, you know, I live with that every day. I thought I was doing the right thing, and so I was really offended by that, and I don't feel like he's ever been put in a situation like that, either to make financial ends meet or anything like that. It was a judgmental comment. I believe that surrogacy does actually target people that are financially struggling. They advertise a big amount of money, and you know, oh, it'll help you out and you can do all this stuff with that money and you know, it's all yours when you're done. I did surrogacy for the money, the financial gain, um, but I'm, I still struggle financially, um, paycheck to paycheck, so it didn't fix everything, it didn't solve anything. Um, it set me back in a lot of ways and it's, it just wasn't worth the reasoning that I did it for. I'm very proud of Kelly. She's been very bold and very courageous. I'm proud of her husband, who's a strong rock of an anchor beside her. She has his support, and they've been um, inc incredibly bold and brave. I would never do surrogacy again, and unfortunately, I'm never able to have more children on my own due to the last delivery. Um, I was advised that if I did have another pregnancy, it could end devastatingly. I learn stuff every day. I actually just recently learned that the preeclampsia can cause me to have heart issues five to 10 years down the road. I'm still gonna be affected long-term. Um, all the estrogen, all the medications I took down the road long-term, something could happen from my choice of being a surrogate. I didn't die that day, but something inside me did.